Well, hello everybody and welcome to Prayer School. I think this is the first time we're doing anything like this in this way. We've done lots of prayer events and prayer sessions and all sorts. In fact, on our website, if you're interested, on our website, we've got loads and loads of conferences and schools and seminars and things that would be a great benefit to you. Now, this is first time we're doing like a live teaching series. So this is completely live. I can see your comments, Carol, Lucy, Dorothy, uh, uh, let me see, who else? Fiona, Rose says, hi, James and Micah Wood. Great. Excited to feast on the teaching from you both tonight. Great. Well, I'm excited to hear from the Lord and be stirred in prayer afresh. Um, let us know where you're watching from, okay? Because I know some of you are tuning in from different parts of the world. Right here in the UK, it is 7-ish p.m., and so uh, we're just excited to dig deeper. You know, in January, many churches, many, uh, you know, Christian ministries around the world uh, set time aside to fast, set time aside to really press into God in prayer. And it's just a good time uh, to do that. The sad thing is many people, they, they, their fast is only in January, and then for the rest of the year, they just feast. But I want to encourage you to not just fast in January, but actually include that in the rest of the year. That's if you're fasting in this season. Now, you don't just fast. You want to add prayer to your fasting. And if Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray, then guess what? We need to be taught to pray. In fact, Romans 8 says, we don't know how we should pray as we ought to. So there's a real sense of deficiency we have, and the Holy Spirit helps us. I love learning about prayer. I love growing in prayer. You know, so tonight is going to be one of those times where we're going to dig deep in the world, in the Word, in the Word of God. Now, I'm going to be keeping track of your comments, and uh, we're going to be interacting as much as we can with you. So feel free to post comments. Uh, I'm not promising to read all of them, but <laughs> I'll at least... Uh, Keep an eye on them. I can see uh, someone watching from the U.S., Sammy watching from London, uh, Jolando watching from the ne Netherlands. Welcome, welcome. Oh, someone watching from Nigeria, South Africa. Well, God bless you guys. Fiona, God bless you. Um, thank you all for uh, Bradford. I can see uh, Gemma from Bradford. God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Again, uh, it's going to be straight into the Word of God. We're going to have a short time just to pray over you guys before we go into the Word. But before any of that, I'm going to introduce my special guest today. Now, I've got uh, my friend Micah Wood. Micah is an incredible man of God. I've known Micah since I first went to the ramp in 2007. Mm -hmm. Gosh, how many years ago? I don't know. I've not worked at that place a long time ago. <laughs> A long, long time. In fact, I think it was just before you got married. I think you were about to get married when I first met you and Delena. So many years ago, Micah is one of those people that, you know, he's a great teacher of the word. He carries a real spirit of consecration. And, you know, if you followed Preston for a while, we often talk about the Nazarite kind of DNA. He carries that DNA. Uh, and he is a, he's a voice, a leader within the ramp movement in the U.S., also in the U.K., Interest, in fact, he and his whole family moved from the U.S. to Manchester. So he's here with his four kids. <laughs> they all moved to a uh, big, big, big deal. Micah, it's so good to have you with us. How it's are you today? It's great to be here. I'm wonderful. It's great to be here, James. Love being in Manchester with you and just uh, running alongside Prayer Storm. Yeah. And it's your first time in this space. I'd love to hear your thoughts because you've probably seen some of our streams from this mm -hmm. very space. So what's it like being here? Is it what you expected it to look like? You know, I think in any kind of television broadcasting, anytime you get to the space, it always feels smaller yeah, in the yeah, actual yeah, space yeah, yeah, than yeah, it looks yeah, 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 on yeah. the screen. And yeah. I don't know why that is, but it, it, I feel like it's always that way. Everyone says that. Yeah. The room is so, so small. So... Today, we're going to be delving into prayer and delving into just, I guess, maybe the way I would word it, theology of prayer mm. and some of the things that would equip us in just being people that have a sustained life of prayer. Many people uh, uh, like the idea of being a person of prayer, but don't want to put in the discipline, some of the things that are required to keep that consistency. And what we want to do today is explore some of that. And as the Holy Spirit leads, we'll be looking at some scriptures. So by the way, get your notepad, get your Bible. Uh, uh, we're going to be just delving into the Word today, and we're going to be uh, believing the Lord to awaken our hearts and stir our hearts mm -hmm. in the place of prayer. So I'm going to pray uh, as we go into the scriptures, and I'm going to hand over to Micah to start off uh, the teaching. And as Micah shares, there'll be points where we're going to have some discussions. I'll probably ask him some questions. Mm -hmm. I'll be keeping track of your comments. Uh, just for those of you just logging in, this is the first of three sessions we're going to be having. We're going to be teaching 
and equipping you in your journey with God. So you know what? Let's pray right now before we go into the Word. Father, thank you so much for this space. Thank you so much for this time that we can go into your Word. We can learn of you. Lord, I ask that as we uh, go through your Word and we talk about prayer, that just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, our hearts will burn within us afresh. Would you release a fresh burning desire for you, a fresh burning desire to seek you in a fresh way as we delve into your word? Father, release revelation, release insight, cause our hearts to be alive in you afresh. Uh, let there be a, almost like an awakening of people, those who are feeling dull and disconnected and bored. Let there be an awakening and excitement in hearts, Father, even as we delve into your word right now. Thank you for Micah being with us in the studio. Would you fill him with that revelation and just that that fire that he already carries, but even more so tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Over to you, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first thing I would say is that there's a lot to learn about prayer. There are disciplines to implement, and those are clear in the word. Jesus teaches those, and uh, you know, Lord willing, we'll jump into those tonight. But I will say this, I think the bedrock for me of prayer is simply hunger. And so before I knew how to pray or before I really even began to implement disciplines or, or before I had a concept of what that rhythm looked like in my own life, all I knew is that I was hungry. And from that place of hunger, I began to sort of find my way into the presence of God. And so for me, prayer was less about you know, making sure I had a, a quota each day or making sure certain disciplines were implemented. And it was much more a hunger driving me. And that hunger came from different places. It came from encounters with God that I had had um, in corporate meetings. It came from seeing other friends that were just carrying a fire for God, their fire, their revelation, their sense of communion with God. And from those sources, it whet my appetite to say, I, I can't stay in this place of sort of stagnant religious experience that Mm. only happens in a church service. Mm -hmm. And so I need to find God on my own. And so for me, that's really where prayer began, is a desire to, um, to, uh, to increase my own personal acquaintance with God. So Mm. one of my favorite books is by A.W. Tozer. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. And he goes through this whole book and defines you know, about 20 or so attributes of God. But at the very last chapter, he talks about this concept called the open secret. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is how do we bring the glory of God back into our church? And he says it's a very simple idea. It's It's an open secret that anybody has access to. He mm-hmm. says, it's the old yet ever new counsel, acquaint yourself with God. Mm. And then he goes on to say this, God can be known in increasing degrees of intimate acquaintance as we prepare our hearts for the wonder. Mm. And so that concept, even though I had not read that book early in my prayer life, that concept of knowing God in increasing degrees of intimate acquaintance, that became the driving force for prayer that then led me to discover disciplines in the Word, rhythms in my life that eventually through the years then became teaching point for others. But Mm -hmm. those were learned because first there was a desire to grow in intimacy with God and hunger for God. I just want to just jump in and comment on that because that's so important what you said there. It's not just going through routines. It's starting with a desire for encounter with a person, Mm -hmm. you know. And one of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 27, uh, where uh, David says, one thing I have desired of the Mm -hmm. Lord. So again, coming back to that thing of desire. Yes. So David was able to narrow his life down to one thing. Yes. And that thing was burning in his Mm -hmm. desire. Then the next part was, one thing I've desired, and that will I seek. Yes. So the desire informed the action. It wasn't yes. just just acting because yes. oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to pray. Something was stirring in him, and it was actually an encounter with God. So that's so important what you just said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the reason that's important is because if hunger does not stay the focal point, if desire does not stay the focal point. I have seen people implement disciplines, hmm. and the disciplines be short lived. Hmm. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to analyze where those, you know, with what the motivation is coming from. I don't know the motivation, but what I do know is that hunger being the anchor of my prayer life mm. causes me 
to continue to cultivate disciplines that accommodate hunger. Mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm. so disciplines in prayer are about accommodating, cultivating, and sustaining hunger. Just what you said. One thing have I desired that will I seek. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the the expression of seeking Mm -hmm. comes from the motivation of desire. Mm -hmm. So I think the starting point of prayer for everybody watching is to 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 begin to ask the Lord for that hunger. Mm -hmm. To begin to ask the Lord for that desire. And if you and if you don't have it. That doesn't mean you can't implement disciplines. It just means as you implement them, remember that that is the goal, is to operate in a level of desire that then shapes your actions around hunger for presence. You know, that's so good. And I want to comment on that again, because I see a lot of Christians um, think about prayer. I am convinced many, many believers see prayer as a means of just getting God to do something for Mm -hmm, them. mm -hmm. And so the only time prayer happens or prayer happens intensely is when there is a need. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a terror attack or someone's got cancer or they need some money. There's just such a a desire to kind of increase prayer intensity, mobilize in prayer. And so people's high points in prayer Mm -hmm. are based on moments of great need. Mm-hmm. But what, you, what we're saying and what you're saying, and this is such a critical foundation to lay, because if you don't have this foundation, by default, you're going to just be praying intensely when something arises that stirs you. Oh, yeah, I need God right now. Then there's going to be intensity. But if it's desire for him, yes. it doesn't matter what's happening around you. Yes. You're still going to be going after yes. him because you're seeking him, not because of what he can give you, but because you want to encounter deeper realms of who he is. Yes, yes. I, I found that in prayer, if... Getting God to act is the sole motivation. Mm. Just just trying to get God to act on your behalf, then prayer can become a, a great source of disappointment when mm. there's the when there's delay yes. in God acting. And there is often delay. <laughs> <And> there is <laughs> delay. But if the motivation is hunger for God and to be with Him, prayer can have a sustained joy mm. even when there's delay in answers, mm. because at least you're with Him. Mm. And so that being with him brings a sustained joy in prayer, even when you're walking through the, the mountains and valleys of mm-hmm. disappointment mm-hmm. and delay and all that stuff. That's good. That's good. Well, so, keep going. All right. Well, so, so let me jump into the disciplines <laughs> yes, then. Yes. Because, as James, you say often, <laughs> desire without discipline dissipates. And so right. desire is wonderful. I love desire. Thankfully, I grew up in a church that cultivated encounters with God. Um, But things really began to shift in my life in terms of moving from complacency, having occasional encounters, things shifted from that rhythm into a sustained place of transformation when disciplines channeled desire into action Mm. and lifestyle and rhythm. So this is going to be very, very simple. I'm going to go to Matthew 6, 6 and teach from, you know, in that one verse, Jesus, like, Packs it full yeah. of disciplines for prayer, okay. and uh, we're just going to make it as simple as possible. And I, what I have found over and over is the more simple this becomes, the more anointed it becomes. Yes, come on, <laughs> come on. That's it's like the more right. the more complex it becomes, mm-hmm. the more unanointed it becomes, mm-hmm. because I don't think the Lord's heart is to make prayer inaccessible. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean it's always easy, but there is a simplicity to prayer. Mm-hmm. And so, just to encourage everyone watching, the the. Um, Again, prayer is, yes, sacrificial. Yes, it requires you to crucify flesh. Yes, there is a, a, an element of prayer that has difficulty to it. However, prayer is not complex. There's a simplicity that is simply expressing desire through action mm-hmm. and through seeking. So we're going to just walk through Matthew 6.6 6 and look at so the if simplicity you go your, of prayer. So if you go to your Bible, so interrupt you. If you go to your Bibles... Get it open. We're going to be looking at Matthew 6, 6. All right, Micah. All right, so from this, I'm going to identify five disciplines of prayer. Yeah. Um, And then it also talks about the result of prayer once you implement these five. But just I'm going to focus on the five disciplines of prayer. Mm -hmm. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, But you, when you Mm -hmm. pray, Mm -hmm. go into your room. Mm -hmm. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So again, an, just an action-packed verse regarding prayer. Mm. So Jesus starts off, but you. Mm. So the first discipline of prayer is the who of prayer, it's you. Come on. In other words, 
If you're a disciple of Jesus, you are a person of prayer. Come on. And sometimes we think that some people are gifted with prayer and some people aren't gifted with prayer. Oh, you're <laughs> staring me by saying that. Oh, my, my, my. Ah. So, <laughs> you, just, you just, you know when people say you've just been triggered? <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt no, your no, flow. Please, I'm sorry. Interrupt at any point. No, seriously. Listen, guys. You can't. There's so many believers that, but that that unconsciously or consciously, I don't know, just believe there is a gift of prayer. Oh, James, you love to pray. You've got the gift of prayer. You've mm-hmm. got the gift. I haven't seen that in scripture. Have you? No. I've not seen anything as a gift of prayer, even a gift of intercession. Now, what I do believe scripture talks about is a spirit of grace and supplication. And I think there's something in there that we shouldn't confuse because the gift could mm-hmm. mean you've got the gift. I don't have the gift, so you know what? I'm going to outsource my prayer life to you now Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you have something I don't have. So every time I need something, I'm just going to send you all my prayer requests. And I often got frustrated with that whole idea that, oh, you like to pray. Uh, You know what? I'll just send you all my prayer requests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But actually, you're not actually pressing into God yourself. So newsflash, no such thing as a gift of prayer. We all call to that. I'm sorry to interrupt No, it's good. (laughs) No, it's good. Well, that's important because if we're a disciple... We need to think of ourselves as a person of prayer Mm. because we're a follower of Jesus. Jesus was a man of prayer. Therefore, his disciples are called to be a people of prayer. So if you're watching this, I just simply want you to say this out loud. It may be awkward because maybe you're sitting around people. Maybe you're by yourself. But just say this. Say, I am am a person of prayer. A person of prayer. Say it again. Say, I am am a person of prayer. A person of prayer. It just feels good to say that. It feels good to say out of your mouth, I'm a person of prayer. Now, sometimes the reason people think that they are not a person of prayer is because when they start to try to implement a a rhythm of prayer in their life, it feels uncomfortable. And what I want to say to people who find themselves uncomfortable in prayer is this, that whenever something is uncomfortable, it does not reveal the level of your potential it reveals the level of your neglect. Mm. And I don't mean that harshly mm. as though, you know, I'm, I'm judging you for neglecting. It's just a reality. Mm. So several years ago, um, my wife led the way in our home of just, you know, wanting to establish a rhythm of exercise. Let's mm. start going to the gym. So so I'm, I'm all on board. I'm supportive. Let's do this. That sounds exciting. So I go to the gym for the first time with my friend, my brother, Samuel Bentley. If you ever watches this, I love you, Samuel. So we go, and Samuel has been going for a long time by the time I show up, but I've got this mentality, anything he asks me to do, I'm going to do it because I'm not going to wimp out on the process. I'm just going to fully jump on board. So we do this very long workout. I mean, halfway through, I thought we were done, and it was only the first section. (laughs) So we keep going. By the end of the workout, I feel not just tired or fatigued. I feel nauseous. I, start, I drive home, and the nausea level increases. And when I get home, I'm so overwhelmed by this uncomfortable feeling. I stumble into the house, and I roll into the floor in the living room. My oldest son, Jack, walks in, and he's terrified, thinks something's happened to me, runs and wakes up my wife. And, you know, Dad's not, you know, something's wrong with Dad. She walks in. <laughs> wow. And so it was a terrible experience. For the several days, my body is aching. Now, the whole reason that was so uncomfortable is because I had neglected that discipline for so long. Mm, mm-hmm. And just like going to the gym for the first time, a lot of us kind of go to the place of prayer. We kind of wander around and we're not sure what to do. If you've ever been to the gym for the first time, you feel like the odd man out. You feel like everyone's looking at you. You don't know what machines to do. Mm-hmm. It's all because you're just unfamiliar. So what I want to tell people is do not let initial uncomfortability make you think, I must not be a person of prayer. Mm -hmm. It's just because it's a neglected area of your life. With greater investment comes greater comfortability. So Stacy Reeser, our our friend who serves uh, serves in ministry here in Manchester, she said this years ago, this progression of discipline, desire, delight. Mm -hmm. And she said a lot of times prayer goes through that progression where it begins as a discipline, most of the time when I start to pray, it's not because I feel like I want to pray. Mm. It's because I know that ultimately I'm hungry for God. I may not feel hungry for God right now, but ultimately I'm hungry for God, so I'm going to begin with the discipline. Mm. And as you endure in the discipline, that discipline begins to turn into desire. It begins to awaken hunger in your heart. Mm -hmm. And then as you're faithful to steward desire, it begins to break into the realm of delight where your enjoyment of the presence of God 
causes you to not want to leave the place of prayer. When you begin, you're making yourself stay. By the end, you don't want to leave because mm-hmm. you've broken through into delight. Mm-hmm. But it all begins with saying to myself, I am a person of prayer. This is not a gift God gives some people and withholds from others. That's this good. is a this is a discipline, this is a decision that every disciple is called to make. That's so good. I'm going to jump on that. I feel like I'm going to keep into No, please. <laughs> as much as you want. But as, you, as, you're stir- as you're speaking, I'm also being stirred. You see, that that verse, you, you, the, the words you just pointed out it says but you but mm-hmm. you and you, you know what that points to me it gives me an idea of something that i know uh, lots of believers enjoy we enjoy lots of corporate gatherings and i think that's right it has its place but i'm convinced there's some things that god wants to do when it's just you yes. and him as in there's some things that he can do in a corporate gathering but there's some things he wants to have with you when you get on your own with him. And there's so many Christians that live their life just based on corporate gatherings. Can I just say this? Corporate prayer meetings should not replace personal call to prayer. Don't yes. don't use the corporate prayer space as a space to replace your personal prayer. We are called to prayer, and vice versa, actually. Uh, personal prayer and corporate prayer are both vital, both necessary. It's not either or, it's both and. But when you say, but you, it means you are called, I am called, we are called, but as individuals to encounter God on our own. Um, I'm thinking of that verse again in uh, Psalm 91 that says, uh, uh, he who dwells in the secret place. And I love that. It, it doesn't even start by saying they who dwell in the yeah, secret place. <laughs> it's like he, it, that's you, that's me. So that that those words that Mackie just pointed out in Matthew 6 says, but you. So you want to say that to yourself, that it's me. I, I am being called, make it personal. Don't make it like for something, for someone else out there. You are being called to this. We are being called to this. And the great thing is he's expecting us in that place yes. too. Yes, yes. So that's the first discipline of prayer. The who of prayer, it's you. Second discipline of prayer, Jesus says, but you, when you pray. Mm. So the second discipline is the when of prayer, which is something you need to schedule. Mm. Way too many of us have an if to our prayer life wow. rather than a when wow. to our prayer life. Wow. I had a friend wow. years ago, and she would always say this, if you don't schedule a time to pray, you'll always talk about prayer but never actually wow. pray. Wow. Wow. And so the things in our lives that are really important, we get intentional about them, mm-hmm. and they make it on ours. They would say in Britain, make it on our diary. Uh-huh. So, so it, How, you guys say what? Well, we would say calendar or schedule. <laughs> or Diary for us in America is a very personal <laughs> journal. It's it's more of like a feminine journal. Oh, right. It's like diary. Like girls keep diary, guys keep journals. It's kind oh, of the idea there. It's like okay. a feminine journal. Okay. Is the idea of a diary. <laughs> Somewhat. Okay. So anyway. But it but but again, the things that are really important in your life, you schedule, you get intentional about. Mm-hmm. And if we don't schedule times to pray, then what's going to happen is we'll fall into the tyranny of the urgent. And everything else in our lives will claim our attention, and we ha- will have the ideal of prayer, mm. but not the actual practice of prayer. Mm. And sometimes when I've talked to people about this, they're hesitant to schedule times to pray because they say, well, I don't want to be legalistic. Oh, yeah. On, uh, that's another trigger for me. <laughs> 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 you know, Leonard Ravenhill said, when Christians find things in Scripture they don't like, they often label it legalist. Wow. Wow. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a cop out. Why don't you say that to your wife? When She's like, oh, we need to we need to have some time to get. I don't want to be legalistic. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I think that's and that's would be the example I use is by me wanting to be have a thriving relationship with my wife doesn't mean that I never get intentional to schedule Absolutely. a date night or times together Absolutely. away from our children or you know uh, holidays things like that. No, it's because I want relationship that I get intentional with my schedule with her. So good. So it's the same thing in your relationship with God. Scheduling time to pray is not being legalistic. It is being intentional with your desire. Absolutely. Because you want to grow in that relationship, so you're going to make time for it. Yes. You know, and then I have other Christians that make comments like, you know, Jesus already won the victory on the cross. You know, it's already done. It's already finished. You don't need to do all this intensity. You know, you're, you're, you're striving. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, what, what do you mean? I'm, because I'm making time to pray, telling mm-hmm. me I'm striving. Mm-hmm. See, this is so important. We make some clear uh, uh, points, even as we lay these foundations. When you make time to pray and you decide you want to set time aside to see God, you're not striving because you've done that. 
I think striving is more for, about where you're doing it from. Mm, yeah. Okay. As opposed to the activity itself. And I love to use the illustration of Jesus going into the desert. The father said, this is my beloved son. And I'm well pleased with him. Why would the father is pleased with him? Why does he have to go fasting for 40 days? His fasting was not to earn the father's love. So the key, the key thing was he fasted and prayed from love, not for mm. it. So when we're going to schedule time to pray, we're doing that from a place of being, knowing that God loves us, we love God. And so from that security, we're spending time. I often say, the last thing you want to do is spend time with someone you know is mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Many Christians don't want to pray, oh, God is mad at me. Well, if you know God loves you, God loves me. If I choose not to pray again for the rest of my life, God still loves me. Now, that would be bad for me, <laughs> mm -hmm. but God still loves me. So I am secure in the fact that he loves me. And so from that place, I'm going to schedule time to pray. Yes. So I just want to break that mindset of legalist. Oh, I'm being legalistic. Oh, I'm doing it in the flesh. No. Where are you doing it from? Are, are you secure he loves you? Then if you're secure about that and that relationship that he wants to draw near to you, if you draw near to him, like he says in James, then let's make this practical. Let's yes. create space yes. for it. Create space. And, you know, in different seasons of your life, you may have to recalibrate your schedule, your calendar. There mm -hmm. are different times and moments where God calls you to prayer in different ways, yeah. and, th and that's fine. Delane and I, my wife and I, we do that. We discuss that with each other mm -hmm. about different rhythms, but again, the intentionality is the point. When do you, does your prayer life have a when mm. or does it have an if? Mm. If I get to pray today, no, when I pray today, I yeah, know when I'm going yeah, yeah. to pray. Now, the Lord can interrupt that and call me to pray additionally or at different mm -hmm. moments, but mm -hmm. in my mind, I have a set time. There's mm -hmm. flex in it, but I have a set time. That's good. So, but you, when you pray, third discipline of prayer is the where of prayer. Jesus says, go into your room. Mm. In other words, go into the place that you have designated as a place of prayer. Mm. But you, when you pray, go into your room. Now, I know saying that, especially in, here in the UK... Well, we have small spaces. We have small spaces. <laughs> That's why your win is so important. Mm, mm. Your win and your where have to work together. Mm, mm. Because if you, don't, if, if you have difficulty finding a place to pray, you may need to look at your win of prayer. Because mm -hmm. my current, in my small British home right now, my place of prayer is not available at every moment during the day. Mm, mm, it's mm, only mm. available during small windows, so <laughs> as a private space. So I have to find, so I schedule my when it, based upon when my where is available. Mm. So you need to see yourself as a person of prayer, you need to have time to pray, and you need a place to pray. The secret place should not be metaphorical about mm. just some mm. like corridor in your heart. You should actually have physical spaces mm. where you build history with God. Yeah, 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 yeah. People in Scripture, they had places where they built history with God, and it's amazing to see the storylines of what God does in those places. And the, the pushback from people I hear, when, you, when even I say that, I preach, what mm -hmm. you said that, they're like, well, you know what, I just talk to God, I just walking mm -hmm. down the road, I just talk to God anywhere, you know, why do I have to have a space? Why is the space important? And I often point them back to this scripture, Jesus says, go into your room. Yes. And there's something about that space that's quite key. He who dwells in the secret place of a most side. I mean, that is almost, that's speaking about a place in God, but I believe that place is connected to your space, actually, the space yes. you create. It's like a secret channel. From your space, you can access his secret place. You know, so there's something quite key about creating that space. And when you keep doing that over and over and over in a space, what tends to happen is you start to, you see, um, you have an atmosphere that is sustained over a period of time becomes a climate. And when you have a climate, some things can grow in some climates and some things will not grow in some climates. So you can go to like a club and some things can easily happen there because there's an atmosphere that's been sustained to host some things. Now, if you start to host the presence of God in prayer in a space regularly, ongoingly, like it's something you do all the time, you're gonna, that space is going to now be conducive for some things to take place. Like, you're going to find it a lot easier to hear from God in some of those mm -hmm. spaces. I mean, I don't even feel this. Like, there's some places you go to, you're like, my goodness, it's so easy to pray here. It's because there has been some activity going on in that place. Yes. Even Jesus had places he went to, mountains. Yes, yes. And I would say this about the, the necessity of places to pray. When we create time and place to pray... What it does is it, it creates a level of focus in prayer 
that it's really hard to find when you're just praying throughout the day. Now, you mm. need to pray throughout the day. Mm. Uh, Paul said, pray without ceasing. There's mm-hmm. a certain level of communion throughout the day yeah. with the Spirit you have. But when you have a time and a place of prayer, it creates a level of focus that's not available otherwise. In Jeremiah 29 says, you will find me when you seek for me mm. with all of your heart. Mm. And a lot of times we're not finding God in the way that's fully available to us because we're not engaging all of our heart, wow. all of our focus. And some of that goes back to we lack a time and we mm-hmm. lack a place mm-hmm. in order to capture our attention and go after God. That's so good, Micah. Take us deeper. All right. So, <laughs> but you, when you pray, go into your room. The fourth discipline of prayer is the how of prayer. He says, shut the door. Mm. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door. So the how of prayer is learning to shut the door. So I want to give three keys to shutting the door. Number one, be unavailable. Mm. In other words, find a time and a place where you can be unavailable, and you can literally shut a door. Mm. So we live in a world of of constant communication, constant access through through our phones and through relationships and that type of thing. And again, the scripture out of Jeremiah 29, you will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. So we have to learn how to be unavailable to people, unavailable to responsibilities, unavailable to our, our text messages and all of these mm-hmm. things so we can really focus on God. And what's, what's kind of interesting is it sounds so simple, but the moment you start trying to be unavailable, your brain starts going crazy. <laughs> About all the reasons why you shouldn't be unavailable mm, 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 and you mm. should be more accessible to your responsibilities and to communication. So that's why the second key of shutting the door is, number one is be unavailable. Mm-hmm. Find a time and a space where you can shut the door mm-hmm. and be private and alone. Mm. Number two is be undistracted. Mm. Because yes, you need to shut the door physically, but you also need to shut the door mentally. You need to find a way to... to Allow your mind to engage exclusively with God. So how do you do that? Because one of the questions I get from people <clears throat> excuse me, often is, yeah, I know how to shut the door, or I know how to get along with God, but my mind is so busy. Yeah. And I'm so, struggling to, my thoughts are wandering. How, yeah. how do you respond to that? So I think there, there are different ways to respond to that. I think number one is with a greater investment in prayer over time, your your mind learns a new habit of focus. Mm. So some of it is just learned over time. A second strategy, which I don't do this a lot, but I've heard other people of prayer teach on this, and I, I appreciate it. Um, sometimes I've heard people teach that, you know, if you find yourself constantly bombarded with responsibilities when you pray, just keep a notepad beside you. When responsibility comes, write it down. And go right back that to That happens prayer. to me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> because that way you're at least externalizing it and you go right back to prayer. Yeah. Another strategy is when you find your mind wandering, rather than getting buried under guilt for having a wandering mind, just recognize, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry my mind was wandering. Help me keep my attention on you. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the guilt we feel over distraction becomes a greater distraction than the initial <laughs> distraction. Because we've all had that experience. You've been pacing in prayer or sitting, and, and, and your mind's just wandering. It, it happens, and the guilt factor becomes a major distraction all by itself. So sometimes it's, it's just a recognition mm-hmm. that, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I want to keep my attention on you, that simple thing. Another thing, and this is something that I do often, is sometimes in my time of prayer with the Lord, I start with the Word first. Mm-hmm. And the reason I do that, I don't do that every time, but I do that often. Mm. And the reason is because it captures my attention and immediately puts it That's on good. the things of God. That's good. So there's different ways, different rhythms, and sometimes when I start with the Word first, it's not always just like where I am in the Bible mm-hmm. in that particular yeah, moment, because yeah, I'm yeah, always yeah. kind of doing different things yeah. in the Word. And, mm-hmm. But sometimes what I do is a Psalms reading plan every day, and then separately I have like time in the Word. So what I do there is I'm getting constantly That's in good. the Psalms because Psalms are prayers, and mm. they are a record of Israel's prayers, King David's mm-hmm. prayers. So doing that type of thing can help capture your mind and catapult you in prayer, but a lot of it too is learning to have sustained focus through greater investment. That's good. I love that. So you have a Psalms reading going mm-hmm. on on the side, separate to your regular kind of Bible reading. Yes. I love yes. that because that's different to what I do. But, you know, it's just inspiration yeah. and hearing all the people who have time with God. Now, another question people tend to ask me is um, things like, you know what, I, I know it's time for me to pray, but... I don't know what to do. Do I worship? Do I pray? Do I pray in tongues? Do I shout? Do I stay silent? Do I dance? Do I? And so yeah. they're like, 
where do I start? Yeah. So what do you say to that? Oh, that's a great question. Well, that's actually, to, to me, that's the third key of shutting the door. Oh, really? And the third key is be personal and be private. Mm-hmm. So be, uh, be unavailable, be undistracted, be personal and private. So Jesus had shut the door. What do you do behind a shut door? Mm. You do things that are not for everyone else's eyes. Mm. The, it, the, there's, there's a certain level of vulnerability and intimacy that happens behind a shut door mm. that can't happen in a public place. Mm, mm. So especially as I've been, you know, I've grown in prayer in different seasons and learning prayer as a young man still in high school and trying to figure out how, what does this desire and seeking look like. My prayer life has gone through lots of different moments where there were times, especially early on, where there were certain worship albums that were ministering to me so deeply, I would just put them on and just lay on the floor and cry. And that, that was it. I didn't know what else to do, but that was mm. enough because I was with him. Mm. Then I'd go through seasons where it was more, I would pace and I would mm. pray fervently in the spirit. Mm. Then it's times where it's much more, I'm contemplative on my couch. Mm. I've got my word open. I got a cup of coffee and I'm journaling and I'm listening and I'm, and I'm pondering what I'm reading. And it's gone through different and I've, what I found is all of it is good because it's all part of the pursuit. And here's what I want to encourage people on this element of be personal, be private. Don't compare yourself to what you don't know about someone else's pr- mm-hmm. private prayer life. Because mm-hmm. sometimes when I would begin in prayer early on, I would begin feeling defeated because mm. I would think to myself, oh, when Pastor Karen prays per- privately, she probably looks like this, <laughs> and I don't know how to look like that. So, oh, so I would I would immediately begin defeated because I would I would immediately try to become something, something you're not that I didn't yeah. I didn't know how to become. Yeah, yeah. So this whole element of of private personal intimacy. Now that doesn't mean you're not inspired by other people or you don't yeah, or you don't yeah, gain yeah. stuff from other people or you don't try to implement things. It's just again the essence. That's why I go back to the essence of. Personal prayer is hunger, yeah, and it's about. I've heard you say this before. You have to learn how to steward and cultivate the move of God in Absolutely. your own life. In fact, I was just going to add to that. This is so key. What you're saying, because I've struggled with this as well. Where it's like, oh, that person prays like, oh, that person prays like this, and I've come to realize I need to be a student, and you need to be a student of the move of God in mm. your own life. In, in other words, you need to understand how God moves with you. You know that famous saying: Christianity is not about religion; it's about relationship. Well, God's relationship with each of us has nuances that's very different. How God is going to relate with you, yeah, there are principles that translate across, but there will be nuances that are very different based on who has made you, the anointing is placed in you, the calling he has in your life. And so that would influence the way he communes with you that would be slightly different to me. And so yes. I can be inspired by you, but I need to study and understand how he's working in me and learn that I'm going to be unique and different and not be intimidated by you walking with God in the way he's called you to walk with yes. God. I tell you, this set me free when the Lord gave me this revelation. And I often share this with people. Because when I pray, I am intense. You know, not just on platform, but from at home. I am, I mean, I'm not always shouting, but there's an intensity. It's it's the way I am made, and it's just me. Now, I say Elijah was just like that, I believe. Elijah was an intense person of prayer. He felt stuff, he expressed stuff, you know. I believe he got, in fact, he got angry and called down fire from heaven. You know what I mean? He, he, he's, a, it was, he's emotional. I'm like that, very emotional. You can ask my wife. Now, <laughs> she's probably watching. That's true. Now, Elijah was intense, but when I think of Abraham, Read how Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. It almost mm. feels like he's having this, um, uh, 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 you know, what's that? When you have the auction, give me 50, give me 40, give me 30. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's having this very, uh, it, uh, what's the word? Very chilled, it's seemingly chilled interaction with God. But that's not to mean it's not effective. It, it, it's this conversational uh, type. When I think of Abraham and when I think of Elijah, Mm-hmm. And then when I think of Daniel, and then when I think of Paul the Apostle, in all honesty, I think of different personalities. Yes. And I'm convinced they all prayed in slightly different ways based on their personality, how yes. God made them. So I think this should set people free that always want to try, you always want to try to be like someone else. What is that? That Who are you? Who has God made you? And is your personality finding an expression in your spirituality? Or are you trying to change yourself to fit into a religious mold that you're not? I am going to be loud, not because God is deaf, but because 
That's just the way it's made me. Now, I'm not allowed all the time, but there are times where it's a lot of releasing yes. of intensity. I don't expect everyone to naturally do that, but that's how I find my expression. In fact, I find release. I find ventilation. When I'm done, I feel different on the inside. Mm -hmm. Now, you might want to do contemplative and still. Now, by the way, there are times where I do that too, but let me just say, there are times where I'm still and quiet, and, but I find that that's not my default posture in prayer, and that's not to knock that either. It's just it's just not my best, you know. I don't find that that's the great, that the place I engage the deepest. Mm -hmm. Or no, no, that's not the wrong way. Not the deepest. That I find that that's not just the place I naturally go to when I'm about to pray. I find that I just naturally go into that intense mode, and and it's good. My God. so good. <laughs> beautiful, wonderful. Yes, and amen. Be personal, be private in the place of prayer. Now, having said that. Um, if someone is starting wondering, you know, where, but, but, but come on, give me something a little more practical. Where do I start? I would encourage everyone, uh, pray in the spirit mm. that that activates. I've heard, maybe it was Corey Russell said this, praying in the spirit keeps the spirit of revelation of, alive on the inside of mm. you. Mm. Pray in the spirit and maybe that's your starting point. Yes, so, absolutely. Anyway, yeah. And if you don't pray in the spirit, if you don't know what we're making reference to by that, we mean praying in tongues. I know many people who watch this channel don't pray in tongues yet. And so we believe it's a gift that the Lord has for you. In fact, it says in Acts 2, this is what Peter said when the, the, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit was released. He said, this gift is for you for all who are far off as many as the Lord will call. Guess what? That includes all of us, as many as the Lord will call. So we believe that the Lord wants to fill you with his spirit and release that grace so such that you can pray in tongues. I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest things in my yes. personal prayer life. And so we want to encourage you to ask. And if you don't feel like you're receiving in that moment where you start praying in tongues, don't stop. Keep pressing in. Because keep asking, keep asking, and you will receive as you keep pressing into God. I believe it's something he wants to release over your life. So good. All right. So let me hit the fifth uh, discipline of devotion, and that is the why of prayer. So Jesus says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, when you have shut the door, Pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Now, later he talks about the fruit that comes out of that, but he says, first, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. So the why of prayer is very simple. It is time spent with the Father. Hmm. So once you embrace the, the identity, I am a person of prayer, therefore I'm going to schedule the time, I'm going to find the place, I'm going to shut the door. The whole reason you do those first four disciplines is because when you finally get to the secret place, the Father is already there waiting on you. So uh, the, the whole idea behind disciplines is what we said a moment ago. It's l being intentional with relationship mm. and leaning into relationship. So something I say often about prayer is this, that in personal devotion, now corporate prayer, it's maybe a little bit different because there's a corporate prayer is much more agenda-based. Mm -hmm. There's a reason you're together. But when I'm talking about personal prayer, devotion toward God, I often say this, in personal prayer, relationship takes precedent over request. Mm. That doesn't mean I never ask God anything. That doesn't mean I never have something on my heart. That never means that doesn't mean I'm never a, a, initiated by the Spirit to pray for something that, that does happen. But the starting point is relationship. It is there to be with Him, mm -hmm. and then out of the overflow of that relationship and that intimacy comes the the secondary initiatives of prayer. So if our prayer life is request before relationship, mm. then the request, again, will be short-lived or, or we'll get disappointed mm -hmm. or whatever. But if it's relationship before request, mm. then the relationship will sustain us through all the ups and downs of the request. That's so good. Now, I might be pulling you back a bit, but yeah. just to talk about the structures within your prayer time, because again... Some people will be wondering about this because you made reference to you often open up the word first. Do you see your Bible study and word time as part of that prayer time? Or do you see them as this is my study time, this is my prayer time? No, I see it as all together. Yeah. And so I'll, t so I'll go back to Psalm 27. So David said, one thing that I desire of the Lord, that will I seek. He says one thing, but then he lists three things. That's good, yeah. He yeah, says, yeah. to behold the beauty of the Lord... Uh, no, what's the first thing he's, he says? Oh, oh, yeah, that yeah. I may dwell in the house of the yeah, Lord all the days of my life. Yes. To behold the beauty of yes, the Lord and yes. to inquire his, in his temple. So he says, one thing if I desire, that will I seek. To dwell, to behold, and to inquire. Mm. 
And so I think he's describing three facets of one thing. Mm -hmm. The one thing is the pursuit. The one thing is the relationship, Mm -hmm. but expresses itself in three ways. Dwell, that is, I just want to be with him. I want to be in his presence. Mm -hmm. Behold, Mm -hmm. that is, I want to gaze upon him. I want to see him. I want to function in revelation. I want to know who he is and inquire. I want to ask him questions. I want to learn about him. I want to investigate his nature. So to me, Bible study fits within the context of inquiring of the Lord and beholding the Lord and being with him where he is. So to me, it's all kind of mashed up together. And honestly, for me, I used to be much more sort of um, my prayer time, however long I had in prayer, I used to divide it cleanly down the middle, and half was prayer, half was Bible study. Okay. Okay. Now it is much more blended, mm, where it's mm. it's a bit of Bible study, wow, but wow, then wow. It, that kind of leads me into <laughs> prayer, and then and then I w- w- lean into prayer to the point where it, it initiates a to thought what? about Scripture, then I go back to the yeah, Word, and then yeah. I've got to journal a bit about that, but then that leads me back to prayer, and then there's kind of a worship element, and I love how it gets blended all together, so and good. so maybe people will be more structured about it and kind of divide it up and say, mm-hmm. well, this is prayer, this is Bible study, and I understand that I did that for a long time. Where I am right now is it all just kind of gets blended I love together. That. I love that. And I often say to people, there's a reason why in Scripture there's no clear five-step plan or ten-step plan to grow in a life of prayer. Like, spend five minutes praying in tongues, mm-hmm. and then ten minutes worshiping, and then three minutes thanksgiving. And then t- you don't see anything like that through Scripture. Mm-hmm. Because I think what you're saying is really key where... I believe God wants us to be led by His Spirit, but also our hunger starts to drive us in His presence. So when hunger is the kind of driving force, the Word, the worship, everything, it, 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 we're expressing our desire for Him through these various channels. I love what we pointed out there in Psalm 27, the various expressions of how that one thing was manifested. Mm-hmm. So that's very helpful, and I, and I, and I love that. Very good. And two, I think, and day to day may even look different. So, for example, there are times I go to, to, to my time with the Lord, my time of prayer, intending to get into the Word. And there may be moments there where I just I get caught in, in something, a glimpse of something in prayer, and I just know I've got to lean in here. And I may stay there the whole time. Mm. And I'm like, well, I didn't get to my quota today. Well, it's no big deal because I'm being led by the Spirit. Mm. And then there are times where I'm really intending to get into a spirit of prayer, but I get caught with something in the Word and I'm journaling mm. and this vein of revelation opens up mm. and it's just capturing what God's saying, capturing, capturing, capturing. It takes oh. the whole time. Oh. And so what I want to say is exactly what James said. Being led by the Spirit is key. Absolutely. That is, um, you know, in the context of hunger... Being led by the Spirit as you grow in establishing this. You know, even as you said that, something else that just sparked up in my mind is coming with humility. Mm. Oh, for me, that's a big deal. And I know it's a big deal in the heart of God as well. When you understand Romans 8, where it says, we don't know how... So we have a deficiency, a natural, inbuilt, God-ordained deficiency. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So that we know that we have to lean on Him. So whoever you think knows a lot about prayer... Great theologian, listen, he says, we still don't know. So he's, he's put that in us so that we always come humble and say, Lord, teach us. So it doesn't matter how much you grow, even in your faith, spiritually, you become a giant, you still need the Holy Spirit to pray. Yes. He enables us. And so I often love starting my prayer in that place of humility. Lord, help us to pray. Lord, yes. lead me today. What's on your heart? Lord, lead. You know. That's such a great place because then his grace comes. He gives grace to the humble, right? Yes. And so there's an enabling that can come in that place. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. I love it. Yes. So I think the last thing I would say for Matthew 6.6 6 is obviously then the fruit that comes out of a life of prayer. Because mm-hmm. Jesus doesn't, you know, I heard Bill Johnson say this one time, we feel uncomfortable talking about the rewards, but but Jesus never feels uncomfortable mm. talking about rewards mm-hmm. because he loves to reward those who seek him. Mm. So Jesus ends the verse by saying, you know, those who implement these disciplines, but you, when you pray, go into your room, when you have shut the door, pray to your father who's in the secret place, then your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. There, mm. is, a, there is an open public reward wow. that comes from a private lifestyle of seeking God. And what I, what I want to say about that is this. <clears throat> Why is a private, personal rhythm of prayer rewarded publicly. And so I want to just say this idea. 
Most of us think that everyone prays, but hardly anyone does. Hmm. And what I mean by that is in, in a focused, personal rhythm of walking with God. Hmm. It's much more unusual than we think. Hmm. And sometimes we think the, the way in which we get rewarded by God publicly is by doing some kind of spectacular thing that would then warrant a spectacular reward. Mm. When really all God's looking for is someone to walk with Him. Mm. You know, God used Noah in an extravagant way Come to on. save the human Come race. Yes. But the summary behind Noah's life is in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 9. Of course, right before that, it says he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But then it says this, the summary of his life. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. But it said this, Noah walked with God. Well, really, beyond his obedience in the ark, all we know about him in terms of backstory is that just Noah walked with God. Well, and to that man of humility and simple devotion and just commonplace prayer of daily pursuit, God says, this is someone I can use to be a preacher of righteousness, mm, to save the human race yeah. as, a, as a model of salvation. So what I want to say is... I know many people watching this, there's a hunger to be used by God. Yes, to know God, but also to be used by God. And that hunger to be used by God is not a bad desire. That's a wonderful desire. The path to functioning in your assignment is the very simple path of commonplace devotion that is actually very uncommon, but we just think it's common, so we don't do it quite as consistently as we should. Oh, that's good, because even as you say that, I'm thinking... We shouldn't use prayer as a means to an end per se. Prayer, for me, that time of God, it's an end in ourselves. So God mm-hmm. is the goal. Because when you said about a desire to be used by God, you can often find people in a place where they're praying because they want God to use them in a massive way, as opposed to they're just seeking Him. Now, is, am I right saying he determines the reward of how yes. he's going to reward that? It's not like you come and say, okay, Lord, that's the reward I want, so I'm going to do this right now. And it's like as you seek him, he rewards you. He does it publicly, and he does it in all sorts of ways, but the key is that you seek him. That's yes. really key, that he becomes the focus. The, the reason why that kind of stirs my heart is I, I, I realize that being in ministry, you're in ministry, and people like us you know, who do preaching and things like that, you know, it's so easy to fall in love with serving God. God, as opposed to the one, it's supposed. Let me say it this way: it's supposed. It, it's so easy to fall in love with the activities of serving God, as opposed to the God we are serving. Yes. So we can get so carried away by all these activities, and we, in fact, that could almost become like all we're after. Oh, I've just remembered a verse that the Lord said to Abraham. He says, "I am your exceedingly great reward." Yes. God said, <laughs> "I mean, Genesis somewhere yes. they say, I am." So God said to Abraham, "I am the reward, not yes. the stuff I promised you, not yes. the big ministry, not the big business, not anything else." God said, "I am the reward," and so that is so key that our hearts actually has that posture of seeking Him. And he is the reward. And then if he wants to reward us openly, great. That whole idea that, uh, what's it, John the Baptist, uh, the angel said about him uh, uh, to Zechariah, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He didn't say he be great in the sight of man. Now, he did end up being great in the sight of man, didn't he? But he was first and foremost called to be great in the sight of the Lord. So that opens up about three things. You can be great in the sight of the Lord and not be great in the sight of man. Wow. You can also be great in the sight of the Lord and be great in the sight of man. You can also be great in the sight of man and not great in the sight of the Lord. Where do you want to be great? I would rather be great in the sight of the Lord than be great in the sight of man. Now, some people may end up being great in the sight of man. That's his choice. He decides that. Mm -hmm. But he has to be our reward. That's beautiful. I love it. (laughs) That stirs my heart. Take take us deep if you have more you want to share on this, Matt. <laughs> well, that's that, that's the essence of those disciplines. Yeah. And yeah. we can go into other places if you want, but that's yeah. the essence of what I wanted to share on this first session yes. is that yes. Matthew 6.6, 6, the simplicity of those rhythms. And I heard this word prophesied years ago. I was in a service, and someone released this corporately over the room. And I just want to encourage people that um, whenever a word is released corporately, this is kind of a foot, like a, almost like a side note is... I, not really about part of the prayer school, but it's just about growing in God. Whenever a word is released corporately, I encourage you to always lean into it, mm. especially when it bears witness to you. And, and this word that was released corporately was not released personally to me, mm. 
But because it bore witness with my heart, with my spirit, I took it as a personal prophetic word. And it became something that has um, fueled me for years. And this word was released corporately in a meeting I was in one time. The minister said, there's a path in front of you that looks common, but is in actuality very uncommon. Hmm. And walking it will produce uncommon results. Hmm. And the Lord used that, that word to speak to me for years, saying, the path of simple devotion looks very common to the mm. eyes of man, mm. but it is actually very uncommon. Wow. And if you'll walk this path, it'll produce uncommon results. Wow. I remember one day, you know, uh, you know, within the culture of the ramp, we really emphasize answering a radical call to discipleship, not settling for something that is just, you know, kind of, you know, in the rhythm of life and, and, and just kind of really you know, complacent, but no, something that really moves the heart of God, full surrender to God, partnering with God and and changing the world, you know, all of that stuff. And so I remember this was kind of early on in the early days of my marriage. I was, you know, um, I guess I'm still a young man. I was going to say I was a very young man then. And I was up one morning and I was was sitting on my couch and, and I'm just praying and I'm like having this internal conversation kind of with myself, with the Lord, and I'm saying, Lord, I don't feel very radical right now. Like, I, I want my life to matter. Mm. I want my life to be significant. I want to be answering the call to discipleship in a way that is that is uncommon. I don't want to just blend it. You know, I'm just thinking all this. I'm having this internal conversation. I didn't say it out loud. And then all of a sudden, I hear the Lord interrupt me wow. and speak to me. And this is what he says, answering the radical call manifests in a life of simple devotion. Wow. And that moment became a defining moment where I realized whether or not this looks radical to the eyes of man, me sitting on my couch in the morning hours in a place of devotion and waiting upon the Lord, this is unusual, this is uncommon, it moves God's heart. Wow, that is so, so, so good. Listen, I don't know how you guys are responding. Actually, I can see some of your comments. Some of you are like, wow, this is a great word, so much to kind of digest and soak and blah, blah, blah. I can see some of you coming. Thank you so much for those comments. As we're kind of drawing to a a close, excuse me, I want to say this. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to respond to all your questions, but if based on the the teaching we focused on today, if you have questions you think are relevant, you know, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Just type them in the chat section. Maybe we can, you know, try to, you know, look into some of them and, uh, and see if we can have some answers for you. We love to interact with you guys as you know as we're doing this live. Uh, I'm I'm so blessed by what you're sharing, Micah. Uh, talk to us about the early days of prayer for you. So, like, uh, what, what were some of your struggles? <laughs> <laughs> so, my I think the very first time I ever I was in high school, and the very first time I was I ever tried to s- establish a time of prayer. Yeah, I was living at my grandparents' house at the time because. Anyway, it's just, it was my last year of high school. And so I, um, someone had given me a poster that was a map called a prayer wheel, mm. where it had a full hour broken down into oh, like yeah. certain minute sections. It was like, pray for this for five minutes, yeah, pray yeah. for this for 10 <clears throat> minutes, pray for this for 15, yeah. pray for this for 10. And it had a full hour of mapped out prayer. Mm-hmm. And so I remember that I started with that, and so, I, you know, it was like five minutes pray for this nation. It was very, like, missional, mm-hmm. five minutes pray for this nation. And so I spend the first, you know, I pray as long as I can, and I'm just, like, hoping that I had gone beyond the five minutes. And I look, when I looked at the clock, it, it was about a minute and a half had gone by, <laughs> and I was so discouraged because I was like, I don't know oh, how yeah. in the world I'm going, and this was my mind, I don't know how in the world I'm going to fill an hour with prayer. Wow. And then, at, you know, that was my discouraging, like, beginning. It was like my first visit to the gym in years. I was mm-hmm. like, this is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. This is terrible. I feel horrible. This, this is not, you know, I'm, I must not be very good at this. But then what happened is, again, I mentioned this earlier, but in the early days, certain worship albums mm. carried a just certain anointing mm-hmm. for my life mm-hmm. that helped lead me into a place of prayer. Mm. Now, I, I don't I, I don't use music that much anymore in my like personal time with the Lord. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it never happens. Actually, it was happening this morning because the Lord was like breathing on something for me and mm-hmm. there was all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff going on. But generally, that's not always my mode. But for a season, 
that is how I learned to find my way into the presence of God personally, yeah, yeah. by seeking the Lord in that atmosphere. So again, that's why, going back to that personal and private thing, yeah. find the rhythm that keeps you in a sustained place of focus and prayer, and then it'll kind of branch out and grow from there. That's really good, Micah. That's so good. I can say so much about what you said there. However, <laughs> without taking into another uh, uh, taking off a tangent, I want to respond to some of the questions. So I want to uh, get our technical guys at the back to help me out. Um, uh, I can see that comment. Can you add? You know, it's okay. I can see it. Add it to the broadcast. Just hit add. Just be, yeah, add it to it. So this lady is asking a question here, saying. Um, uh, what can we do to steward humility, especially if you have people who look up to you and your walk with the Lord? <laughs> so, so much. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you can answer that. No, I, I think for me, it's staying in the place of knowing I don't know it all. Yes. I don't have it all. Even though I'm walking with the Lord, there's so much I don't know. Yes. And so when I, for me, this manifests in corporate uh, uh, settings um, where uh, when I'm leading a prayer meeting, oftentimes, depending on the size of the prayer meeting, I like people in the prayer meetings to know that I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. So I give them room to express what God shows them. And oftentimes I do that by saying, uh, there's a scripture in Corinthians that says, we have the mind of Christ. I often like to point out, even though I do believe that I have the mind of Christ in a sense, but I love the fact that it says we have the so mind good. of Christ. So it's not about I having the mind. We have it together. So there are parts of the mind of Christ that's deposited in you for this prayer meeting. Mm. That's not probably in me. So I don't have it all, which means as we begin to pray, I need to listen to the part of the mind you have. And so I welcome your prophetic words. I welcome, especially if you bring in the right spirit where you are also seeking him. Because, you know, we've been in prayer meetings where people bring all kinds of weird words. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we are in the spirit. So people start to see that you have a posture of humility. It's a posture of your heart because you know you don't know it all. And that's when you start to value the giftings within the body. And so no matter how mature you are in Christ, God doesn't give you everything. That's why we're a body. So when you start to think that way, I think it naturally manifests in the way you communicate with people. Yes. Do you have any? No, it is, that is so rich, so good. <laughs> Another thing I would say about cultivating humility as a leader um, like, like the question said, when people are looking up to you and there's, there's a certain level of influence that's making a positive impact, this is kind of a, a huge idea and like almost for its own session. But one of the ways in which we cultivate humility is reminding ourselves of where our righteousness comes from. Mm-hmm. Because though, I'm, though I am a, um, a proponent of and teacher of consistent prayer, fervent consecration. I mean, this is just my DNA. It's who I am. Our righteousness doesn't come from our consistency Mm, in prayer. mm, mm. Neither does our righteousness come from our level of consecration. Mm. The Lord spoke to me one time, this was several years ago, because I was feeling very heavy about all kinds of stuff. And I was like, Lord, am I consecrated enough? Am I consecrated enough? Am I consecrated enough? The Lord spoke to me very clearly one day and said, no level of consecration will ever be strong enough to overcome the voice of accusation. Wow. Because <laughs> consecration was never meant to overcome accusation. The only thing that can do that is the blood of Jesus. Wow. So even when we see, actually, when we put it in the context of prayer, Jesus told a parable in Luke about two people coming to God in prayer. Mm. One says... Lord, I thank you I'm not like these other sinners, yeah, yeah, but I'm yeah. righteous before you. Yeah, yeah. And his, his idea of righteousness was resting in his own consecration and consistency. Mm-hmm. Then another person came in and said, Lord, beat his chest and said, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. Mm. And Jesus said, which one went away justified? Mm. The one that had humility and recognized that his righteousness didn't come from himself but wow. from God. So wow. our access to God is not granted on the basis of our consistency yeah, or our consecration. Yeah. It's... Mm. It's granted on the basis of our righteousness, which comes as a gift Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to us through Jesus Christ. And because we have access in righteousness, therefore, we consistently go to the place of devotion. We consistently go to the place of relationship. We consecrate ourselves to the purposes of God Mm -hmm. to protect intimacy with God, but that's not where our righteousness comes from. That's so good. I think humility is a posture of your heart, not so much just the activity that you do. Because mm-hmm. if you carry yourself humble before the Lord, 
I believe that will manifest so easily in other things. So technical guys, can you pick a question? And then, uh, yeah, so there's one I just saw you put. Yeah, let's see what. So this person said, does it matter what time? Does it, let me see that again. It says, does it matter what time? What about distractions, early morning? What, a, what about on your knees or sitting in a chair? Okay, okay. So they're asking several questions. There. Does it matter what time? And they say, what about distractions in early mornings? What about, you know, do you need to kneel? What about sitting in a chair? You know, mm -hmm. all these kind of postures. What do you say to that? Well, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> so I think on time, uh, it's what goes back to what you said a moment ago. Becoming a student of the move of God in your own life. Mm. You know when you pray best. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you always look for the most cushy, comfortable moment. But what it means is, what is that time in the day where you have the availability to shut the door and focus on God? Wow, wow. And how do you arrange your schedule around that? Mm -hmm. So does time matter? I think there's a biblical argument for early morning. There's a biblical argument for late at night. Mm -hmm. There's a biblical argument for through the night. There's mm -hmm. a biblical mm -hmm. argument for three times a day. <coughs> you can all use sorts. A, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of timing for prayer throughout mm -hmm. Scripture. Mm -hmm. I think you need to find the time and the place where your heart can be most engaged for max, maximum fruitfulness. That's so good. So that's my thought on time. And I think when you look at the life of Jesus, he prayed through the night, but I guarantee you he didn't pray through the night every day. Because that's the scriptures good. also says in, Math, in Mark 1, he got up a great while before daylight. Mm. So mm. he did get up, but then he also stayed up. And I think what determines those things are the seasons and the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are times when you need to pray in the night. I mean, we do night yes. prayers here. There are times when you need to pray in the morning. There are times you have to be inspired. You have to learn how to lean into the Spirit. In fact, I think one of the signs of spiritual maturity is that a person is more dominated by the leadings of the Spirit than the other flesh. One day I was driving... I just started praying in the Spirit. I didn't even know why I started praying in the Spirit. Literally, a few seconds later, I almost crashed. So I was like, oh my goodness, that was the Holy Spirit stirring me to pray, to intercede for something that was just about to happen that I didn't know was about to happen. So, you see, you gotta, you can't, oh yeah, I'm gonna always pray on my knees and pray, pray in this position, and it's always gonna look like this, and it's always gonna feel like this. Well, the Spirit, what is it in John? Those who are of the Spirit, they're like the wind. You don't know where they're coming from, you don't know where they're going. Mm -hmm. That's because the Spirit can be so spontaneous in how He leads. However, with the whole idea of the discipline is to keep you in the momentum and the structure that helps you to have consistent growth, just like going to the gym. But in the midst of that, there are times where the Holy Spirit breathes and says, oh, actually, change your, change your time in here. Yes. Do this here. And so it's not necessarily something like a set rule. You have to lean into the leading of the Spirit in your life. Okay, let's see. We'll pick another question here. Question. Is favorite scriptures... Okay, okay, so let's go with Ray's question. I think there's a question for you, Mike. It says, uh, what are the favorite scriptures that have taken you deeper with God? <laughs> uh, all of them, all of them. They, they all have an... Even all the begats they, and they, begot yeah, and all the they, genealogies. They all, have an, they all have an invitational element to them. Uh, wow, there's a lot of different ways I could, I could answer that question. A lot of different ones. Um, I'll just say... I'm trying to decide, like, Lord, well, how do you want me to answer it? So I'm like listening. Well, I'll just, I'll just mention this one um, because it came to my mind as soon as the question came up. So maybe that's a science of the Lord. Uh, Daniel chapter six, verse number ten. I love this. Um, now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his, in his upper room. We all know about the Acts 2 upper room, corporate mm, prayer meeting. That's good. But Daniel had his own upper room. That's good. I like that. I like that. I like that. He went to his <laughs> upper room, and with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. Mm -hmm. So Daniel praying three times a day... We think that sometimes we think that was like David's Daniel's like reaction to mm -hmm. the decree. Mm -hmm. The decree is you can only pray to the king. Well, I'm going to go pray three times a day. Daniel just kept doing what his custom was since his early days. So mm -hmm. since he was a child, he had a time and a place of prayer, mm -hmm. and he was consistent in that rhythm. But here's what I want to say about Daniel in the place of prayer. It says that he opened his windows toward Jerusalem. Now, he had done this since he was a child. Here he is much older in his life. Mm. So Daniel 
knew how to keep fresh air on old prayers. Wow, come because on, Because he head. kept his window open. <laughs> and so I think one of, the, one of the keys for prayer is knowing how to keep windows open wow. and fresh air blowing on old prayers wow. and even rhythms that we've been doing for years, but they constantly come from a fresh place. That is so rich. My goodness. So good. So good. So good. Thank you for that question. We're going to take a few more questions. Actually, maybe a couple more questions. Then we're going to wrap up. I am looking at a question here. Um, okay, let's go with Fiona's question. It says, how do, we, how do we balance not being legalistic in prayer? but aim to spend quality time... Oh, that's a good one. Oh, I'm already triggered now. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've used that word triggered more in this broadcast than I've ever used my whole life. <laughs> Seriously. How do we balance not being legalistic in prayer, but aim to spend quality time with God? Okay, now the camera's covering my view. Let me see. For example, um, let me see. For example, I often hear people saying we should aim to pray for one for one hour. Okay. Can you just put that question back up? Okay. So let me read it again in case it didn't come out clear. How do we balance not being legalistic in prayer but aim to spend quality time with God? For example, I often hear people say we need to pray for one hour. How oh, do- okay. I thought you I thought you were getting triggered so you were oh, going to answer. But no, well, I, can, I, can, I can answer. Okay. Well, I, you go first. You okay. go first. I want to hear well, what you have to say. I, I think um, to me it goes back to starting point where stuff coming from. It's how you answered that earlier about legalism. Um, it's not legalism if I know the Father loves me. Yeah, That's my starting point, yeah. and that's why I'm here. I'm here because He's already demonstrated His love for me through the cross of Jesus, so I'm here <clears throat> to want to be with Him, not to the thought you spend an hour in prayer. I, I don't. It's not a bad thing to me to set objectives mm-hmm. because you want to grow. Yes, you want to grow a stamina. Yeah, and, and you say within yourself, I'm uncomfortable. When I hit... 33 minutes, I'm uncomfortable. I want to go beyond 33 minutes. Mm. I think that's great. Now, I think that can become legalistic if you beat yourself up Mm. over Mm. the fact that it's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. after a certain time period. Mm -hmm. You know, that there is grace in Christ where He is always invitational in a warm way. However, that doesn't mean, so settle for where you are. What it means is recognize I need to grow, but my starting point is he loves me. That's why I'm doing this. Yeah, that's so good. Now, there's several things that triggers me in that question. Let me just start with the last one, praying for an hour. Now, Jesus did say to his disciples, can you not tarry with me one hour? And I know people use that saying, you should pray for an hour. And I do agree that it's, it's a good place to start. But I often encourage people to start with where you're at now because you may not be able to do an hour right now because you just don't have that stamina. But you can do 30 minutes. Well, start there. Lord, I want to spend 30 minutes with you. I'm going to wake up 30 minutes earlier. Be realistic. Some of you here are teaching on prayer and they're like, okay, I'm going to pray for five hours every day. Well, you can't even pray for 30 minutes. You want to do five hours? Start where you are. And what I find is, as you start where you are, that is going to grow. Now, that leads me to the other thing that also triggers me in that question. It says, how do we spend quality time with God without being legalistic? Some people say, oh, you know, it's about the quality, not the quantity. And I understand that, but you can't say that to your wife. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> you can say, oh, you know, it's about the quality. We're just going to spend two minutes together right now, and it's going to be a quality time, and then, you know, forget it. If, you, if you're thinking that way, it's because you're not in love. What? <laughs> <laughs> Where is your desire at? Because if it's quality, you're, if you really want to go deep with God, then you're after quality. And when you touch quality, that quality is going to become quantity. Yes. So you can't just say, oh, you know. It's a, you, now, you have to balance that with being real with where you are, but don't just settle for where you are and think that is it. I believe Jesus was calling his disciples to pray because they'd been with him for three and a half years. This was the end of his life. I mean, they, they told him, teach us to do this thing. They've watched him do it. They've watched him do it. They've watched him. Now he's at the end of his life. He's invested three and a half years. Now he's saying to me, come on, after three and a half years of being with me, you should be at least able to do one hour. 
And they couldn't do that one hour. So, you know, now you may not have had that kind of investment they've had. Maybe you have done, and maybe actually you should be doing an hour because you have that kind of stamina in God, but you're so busy with Disney Plus and whatever else is out there that you're not able to do that. Then the Lord is saying to you, well, can't you give me one hour? But for some of you, it's like, actually, you're still growing in that stamina. Mm-hmm. And it's like, actually, you can do, you can do 30 minutes. You can do, you can do more. I, I think 30 minutes is a reasonable amount of time to say, okay, I'm going to push myself in this. I, I, but having said that, though, to be honest with you, I remember the first time I prayed for an hour, just like you sharing your story about the wheel. And honestly, I felt like I'd achieved the most significant thing in my faith. <laughs> it was like, I did it. I can't believe I did it. <laughs> and then the other times like you think the time is going, and you're like, oh, I must have done an hour. And I look at that, five minutes gone. No way. No way. I've prayed everything I know to pray. So listen, some of these struggles, most people go through them. And often they're just a sign of your development and things of the spirit. When you truly encounter God, you become more spirit conscious than flesh conscious. And that's when time kind of loses that kind of... You, you, you're, you're less conscious of time. And that does happen. But it takes time. So don't get carried away by all these, okay, um, you know, I have to do it for t- uh, uh, two hours, three hours. Now, in fact, I need to balance what I'm saying with this. There are times where God can give you specific directives. And you know he's called you to invest. You know, the mm-hmm. watchman, he's called you to invest yourself in prayer at certain times and, you know, and certain watches. But... If you're not sensing directives from the Lord and you're just wanting to pursue and grow in this, then start with the reality of where you are. There are times though God will call you. I want you to spend the next seven hours in my presence. Mm. And you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> Lord, help me. How am I going to do that? But I'm telling you, if the Lord is calling you to do that, then there's grace. There's grace to do that. So I'm going to stop that because I'm going to keep going on. Let's take maybe one more. Do you, do you want to come in about that? No, so good. <laughs> okay, let's take one more question. Guys in the back, can you help me? Uh, uh, pick a question. Okay. All right, okay. This is going to be our final qu- Sorry, guys, I know you're typing lots of questions, but we can be here all evening. This is week one of a three-part series. So n- next week is going to be week two. Okay, so this is the question we're going to go for. I said, my question, since prayer is conversational, if I ask the Lord a question and I feel like, um, oh, let me read that. If I ask the Lord a question and I feel like I haven't gotten an answer, or maybe I have, but I, ha- I can't discern it, how can how do you approach that? Basically, asking the Lord a question, mm-hmm. feeling like you haven't got an answer since prayer is conversational. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that you keep you keep asking the question. Absolutely, and and part part of the nature of God. I, I love the scripture out of Proverbs. And um, I can't tell you the exact reference, but I know that it's in there. And, and if you Google it or something, you'll find it. It says, it's the glory of God to hide a oh, matter. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's the glory of kings to search it out. Yeah, yeah. And there's something about the nature of God that loves to hide things. Mm. Not necessarily because, it's not because he doesn't want us to know it. It's because he loves the, the process of pursuit mm. and growth and inquiring of the Lord that happens it, something special happens in us when we keep leaning in, asking God those questions. That's so good. And so I say, just don't stop. J- mm. Just just keep lingering, keep listening. Or if it's the next day, the next, the next. I think this, mm. the Psalms, again, give us precedent for asking God the same question over and over. Yeah, because I'm... Often they ask, how long, O Lord? Mm. How long, O Lord? Mm, 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 mm. And He doesn't respond for a long time, but... He does eventually, but that's another even story. G- even Jesus repeated his prayer yes. <laughs> in the garden. You know, yes. so, so there's a president for coming before God consistently with the same question. And what I found is when I do that, oftentimes it takes a while, but God answers in unusual ways, dreams, words that just bring clarity. Some of the significant dreams I've had have come off the back of asking God questions. Lord, what are you doing in this generation? Lord, what are you up mm. to? What? And it keep it's just been on my heart. And sometimes I've not even articulated the question, but I can just feel, you know, sometimes you've not said something, but you it's just there. It's just, you're just carrying the, the burden of it. And so bringing that before the Lord opens you up to receive things. And I love to think of it this way as well. Like when God is wanting to release things, I believe he's releasing treasures, he's releasing things that are that are dear to his heart you don't no normal person would like to give that which is valuable to you just give to someone that doesn't really value it that much Mm. 
And maybe sometimes the holding back is really drawing that inner value for what he's about to release. Because if you receive it cheaply, you're probably just not going to care as much about it as if you've been invested in it and he gives it to you. You're going to value that word a lot more than just the word I just heard by the wayside. But when you keep asking, you post yourself to receive revelation, I believe. All right, guys. Um, <clears throat> We're going to uh, call it a night right there. Now, I want to just uh, let you know some more about Micah. I want you to follow him on social media, Micah Wood on, uh, on Instagram. Uh, I believe it's on Facebook as well. Micah is an incredible Bible teacher. I've listened to a lot of his teachings and so stirred, even in prayer. Um, Micah is a leader of the Ramp Church uh, here in Manchester, but also just the Ramp Global Ministry from the U.S. has moved to Manchester. You can find out more about him online. Now, also, if you're watching, you're a minister, and you want to connect with someone that has a half a prayer to come and teach and equip people in your congregation, Micah is the person, I believe, one of those people God's raising up. And I don't believe God sent him here to the UK by accident. I think you have an assignment here. And I believe some of that is connected to this watchman thing that you're carrying, you know, with prayer and all that. So, obviously, if he loves prayer and we love prayer, we're obviously going to connect. There's no other way about it, you know. <laughs> this is prayer stone. We're all about prayer. So, definitely do connect with Micah. Now, something interesting is coming up this week on Friday. We've got an all-night prayer meeting. Now, we've been teaching a bit about just devotional prayer. All-night prayer, we're going to be doing probably more intercessory type prayers. Now, listen, one of the ways to grow in your passion for prayer is get around people that love to pray. So there's one thing about stewarding that, that desire in you, but one of the ways you can do that is get in an atmosphere where people are pressing into God. Maybe you've never prayed for five hours before. Well, Join us for the all-night prayer. Maybe you've never prayed all night before. Well, this is your opportunity. You can join us online right here on our Preston channel on YouTube. Or you can physically come to the meeting, but you need to register on our website, prayerstorm.org. We're going to be praying through the night, pressing into God for personal revival, regional revival, and national revival. So we're really believing for God to move. And thankfully, Micah is also going to be there. Micah and his wife, Delena, in fact, his children are going to be there as well. So... Come and join us for a night of pressing into God. Another final thing I want to point your attention to, especially those of you watching on YouTube, even those of you watching on Facebook as well, if you would like to support the work of Prayer Storm, if this teaching has been a blessing to you, well, why not share it with someone? I'm sure there are people in your world right now that could do with some of the things we've just been sharing about prayer to equip them because God wants to raise up a praying army. So send this out to them. Like the video, share it with them. You know, it's a great way to support the ministry. Now, apart from liking and sharing the video, if you want to support by giving, very easy to do that. Go over to prayerstorm.org. We appreciate your support. We're so thankful for you, every one of you that supports this movement. So we're going to stop there for today. Now, next week, we're going to carry on this teaching. Uh, we're doing three, three sessions. This is session one. Sadly, Micah's not able to join us next week, but we're going to have Micah more on with press some stuff. So, you know, watch this space. You know, I'm, I'm serious. This guy is, is an amazing man of God. I honestly value everything God's deposited in him. Uh, someone said, what's what's. What is your YouTube channel? Someone's asking Micah. Micah, do you have a YouTube channel? No, I don't. <laughs> no, Mike. if you look at Ramp Church YouTube channels, there'll be yes. lots of oh, oh, yeah, yeah, content. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Once again, just type in Ramp Church on Actually, just the ramp on into YouTube. On the ramp US, and you have the ramp UK. Lots of Micah's teachings are on the ramp UK. He's currently doing a series on the Watchman. It is powerful. Listen, so just check up some of his teachings. There are lots of his teachings on YouTube right here, so you can look that up. Okay, let me see. Someone says, yes, this teaching has been a blessing. Thank you, Fiona. I appreciate the feedback. Well, on that note, we are going to pray. Actually, Michael, why don't you pray for us as we wrap up this session for all those watching and uh, those that have just stirred to kind of go and develop this secret place and devotional life of God. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. And Lord, we ask that the words that um, are in your scripture, they would become fire in our hearts, Lord, just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Mm. Father, we ask that this starting point of hunger would be stirred in our souls by your grace tonight in Jesus' name. And Father, for everyone who has felt like a failure in prayer, 
or it has allowed the voice of accusation to shut them down or the voice of the enemy to cause them to think that they are not a good prayer. Therefore, they have sort of you know, pulled back from this. Father, I ask that there would be a resurgence of your call in their hearts. Lord, a resurgence of the affirming love of the Father that invites them closer in the name of Jesus. Mm. And Father, I ask that every single person watching this, listening to this, Lord, would have um, great revelation of the verse in James that says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Mm. And Lord, may that holy invitation burn in our hearts and call us forward in Jesus' name. Father, I ask for a grace for prayer, Mm. a grace for fasting, Mm. a spirit of wisdom and revelation within the word that we would grow to know you more deeply and wonderfully in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amazing. Uh, Lots of... Lots of just great encouraging comments from you guys on how this has been amazing. Carol says, Carol says, such powerful teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you are saying on that. Really, really appreciate your feedback. Well, we're going to sign out right there, and we hope to see you for all that prayer meeting. That's going to be our next live stream here at Prayer Storm uh, TV. We're going to be streaming all night from uh, 11.45 UK time on Friday, I believe it's the 20th. Is it the 20th? I think it is mm-hmm. this Friday, uh, all the way till 6 a.m. Uh, GMT UK time. So do join us for that and have a blessed time and remain a person of prayer. See you soon. Yay!